No, no, no. Dark chocolate hazelnut, no doubt. Yeah, oh yeah. That's the dark amazing, dark yeah. chocolate hazelnut is the business. German German um, brand um, yeah. and a German sports brand, but for, it's definitely my favorite chocolate bar. Ritter, by the way, Ritter Sport, folks. Ritter Sports is the only chocolate bar you should be interested in. Chocolate square, in fact. Adam Gordon eats the entire square once per day. That's no good. You've got to eat one of the little squares. That's how you do it. So um, quickly, can I just quickly say something? You know how it's called Ritter Sport, and I don't think it's very sporty, really. And then you've got things like Ralph Lauren Polo Sport. Well, there was a lot of sport is attached to a lot of brands, and you know it, it kind of gets a certain type of person buying it. Well, yeah. when I was at university, my friend was going to set up a brand of cigarettes, and he was going to call it like Marlboro Sport, that type of thing, because he just it. thought there's definitely a gap in the market for this. It's pe people that want to feel as if they're athletes, but in fact walk around, you know, no, no good. Anyway, welcome everybody to Brain Food Live on Air. We are back with episode 67, folks. Um, delighted to, to be here, bringing it to you every Friday, non-stop. It might be the 37th week of the year. I don't even know, but it should be because we haven't missed one yet, I think. Um, so welcome everybody to the show. Very excited uh, to speak with you today because we've got a special guest for us. Um, he's actually a repeat guest one of the few guests that we invite back because he was so good last time. It's Andy Foote, and he's going to be talking about LinkedIn updates. Uh, and today, I'm thinking of bringing Andy back on a quarterly, actually, because LinkedIn changes so much. I think if we can get him to come in and say, look, last three months, this is what's happened. Would that be valuable? Comment below. Let me know if that's the case, because I think it would be. Anyway, quick sound check for everyone in case you can hear me, because I'm not sure you can. Crowdcast, if you're in Crowdcast, can you just say hello? Let me know you can hear me okay. LinkedIn Live, I believe we are broadcasting on LinkedIn Live. If you're there, can you just please say hello and say, yes, Hong, I can hear you. Get on with it. Um, and I should be on Facebook. God help me. Um, Facebook Live, if you are there and you can hear me, please say hello. Um, okay, we're getting a few hellos there, which is good. Facebook's good. LinkedIn's good. Even Periscope's good. We're all good. Anyway, um, quick word for our sponsors before we begin the show. Um, episode 67 is sponsored by our buddies at Indorse. Indorse are an amazing company coming out of Singapore. Uh, they provide uh, lots of different services, actually, for companies hiring software engineers. Um, so they provide online testing, which is super important these days. If you're hiring for people uh, that are remote from your business, you need to test their technical capability. Uh, they do online hackathons. So if you think about hiring people in bulk, technical people in bulk, they've got an online solution for that. And the latest thing, they've got a product called LinkedIn Metamorphos, I think. Um, but it's there to help manage the sentiment of your remote developer team. Uh, so imagine if you had a team that was working in-house and you've had to send them, you know, in the COVID era, you have to disperse them back to home, but you need to monitor how they're feeling, how they're doing. They've got a product that sorts you out just for that. Free trials on all of those uh, folks. So if you want to check any of those things out, go ahead and check out Indoors. I'm going to share the link uh, in the Crowdcast chat stream. It's I N D. Uh, o R S E dot I O. Okay. Um, uh, uh, on to the show, folks. Um, uh, uh, welcome to Adam Gordon again. Adam Gordon back on the hot seat. Uh, it's two weeks in a row for you, man. That's unusual, isn't it? Um, usually I upgrade you like, every other week, but I failed in two weeks' time. Uh, t t t two, two weeks in a row. Well, I was thinking about that 37 episodes so far this year. I wonder how many I've done. Probably 25. Somewhere between 25 and 30. Vast maybe? majority. Vast majority. You, you're, you're, you're here unless you can't or unless you're not interested in topic uh, or unless, you know, there's a better person, quite frankly. Uh, <laughs> I'm, never not, hold on, I'm never not interested in the topic. It's always because there's a better person. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's go to the brain food. Did you read it, man? Did you read it last week and uh, what was interesting? Yeah, I did. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I am... Um, really really fascinated by the concept of people selling referrals yes. into their organization so yeah. I work for the company that everyone wants to work for and if you also want to work there then you can connect with me and I get money to refer you in for a job absolutely brilliant I think that um, I think that you liked my uh, my comparison with like Boba Fett would have joined this yeah but bounty, bounty. hunters anything for money 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's really unethical. I think there's so many problems with this, really big problems with it, but I'm not at all surprised that it yeah. exists. Uh, yeah, so, and so fascinating. Yeah, so for a bit of context for people who didn't read it, basically there's a second marketplace for referrals. You know, people pay referral bonuses. For, you know, let's, who, who do you know help with work for us? Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a website which actually allows you to post that opening and then the person who is kind of volunteering themselves forward as the candidate will actually pay you to be, to refer you that candidate into the thing. So if I wanted a job with Facebook, Adam work for Facebook, I say, here, Adam, here's 50 quid. Can you refer me? You say, All right, fine, in you go. So very easy to make some money out of it. It's obviously corrupt. Um, but at the same time, it got me thinking, isn't the recommendation idea itself kind of corrupt? Um, you know, the idea of recommending people. Yes, we love it. Yes, it's a quick way to hire people we like. Uh, yes, great for cultural fit, quote unquote. Uh, but at the same time, are we hiring the best people? Um, or are we kind of just, you know, taking what is low hanging fruit and not asking too many questions where that fruit came from? You know, uh, what, I wonder if it, about that? there's been a, there's been a long held criticism of employee referral, which is that it's contrary to diversity, because if I'm going to refer my friends, my friends are probably white males in their 40s. So that's going to be a bit of a problem, perhaps. So, you know, if people are just paying me to make the referral, then that doesn't matter at all. So yeah, I it, if it's... it might help you and I. Uh, well, would it though? I mean, it would because the price is actually quite low. It's like fifty dollars. I mean, if it was a bigger number, I would have thought, yeah, maybe poorer people won't do it. But you know, fifty dollars is nothing for us, anybody living in San Francisco. Uh, well, apart from you know people in work, I, I should rephrase. But if you're working, if you're going from one tech company to another tech company, fifty dollars is throwaway cash. Um, yeah. However, going back to your point that referrals can uh, lead to poor diversity, um, you can also use it in a proactive way to tap into networks of underrepresented groups that can actually promote diversity at the higher level. So, for instance, I've seen one of the recommendations if you wanted to excuse me, diversify your workforce, one of the things you can do is actually explicitly go to folks that are from underrepresented demographics and then go to them first with the referral uh, scheme and say, hey, listen, we particularly want people that you know uh, that could be suitable for this. So there's, there's a yes or no answer to whether it, it kind of helps diversity or not, but it also helps depending on where, you, where you're looking for diversity. Are you looking at the level of the company, level of the department, level of the team, whatever, all of that's going to be different. That's another question for you. Which departments in company are the most diverse and which aren't? Um, I'll bet you something, HR not very diverse. Um, well, Florian's just made a point. Every Florian I've ever met, by the way, is really smart. This is another smart one. Um, and uh, he's, say, he's saying that like team sourcing sessions are great. Uh, you know, good, they're fun, good for devs to go crazy on LinkedIn. Um, and I agree with that. A sourcing party, uh, that's a good way of doing it. I wonder if you do a sourcing party, do the do the devs diversity. or whoever you're doing it with, do they do it? Do they do it for the pizza or do they do it for the uh, they do, it, do they do it for cash money? I don't know. Who knows? But it's worth doing. I mean, I, I totally get what you're saying as well, Florian. Getting the developers involved in the sourcing and actually they've got really good skills to help recruiters. You know, they could write the scripts that we're struggling to automate. They can literally do these things for you. Um, so, uh, so you can go ahead and do it. Okay, uh, one more, Adam. Uh, in fact, no, two more. Uh, let's keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, LinkedIn's, I, well, on the subject of uh, inclusion, I guess, rather than diversity, being able to pronounce somebody's name uh, is something that's really important. Somebody did it to me yesterday. I got on a call with somebody. I said, hello, Hanali. And she said, it's Hannah Lee. And I said, ah, sorry. Okay, fine. Good. Right. Most people don't do it. They just let the other person continue saying their name wrong. So yeah. LinkedIn has created a uh, feature which allows you to just click record, say in the name of your, uh, say in how you, the pronunciation of your name, and then other people can see how do I pronounce that name. Um, and uh, yeah, really smart thing to do. Uh, I tried to do it myself. I think it's probably quite easy to pronounce Adam Gordon, but I uh, did uh, try and do it myself. And unfortunately, um, for some reason, I think my, my Wi-Fi cut off halfway through it and it didn't, it didn't end up working. And then I couldn't find out to get back to it. So I only did it when it was referred. It was like 
right on my screen as a, as a notification. Why don't you um, follow my instructions? I mean, because I basically give you like an idiot proof guide on how to do it. Because I because because I'd already I already seen it when I saw your when I saw your instructions. I'd, I'd already I'd already been through that pitfall. But anyway, I will do. Right, I'll right. Go back and follow your instructions. On this note, by the way, I think it's really useful tool. Um, simply because there, there are people that obviously will mispronounce names. As a recruiter as well, when you're doing first contact, it can be really important to get someone's name right because you know I'm sure the person who has um have having to Hanley, for instance having to explain every time just gets slightly annoyed um and that can really kind of change the tenor of the conversation if you're trying to open a sale you're trying to kind of encourage this candidate to be interested in your job and you've straight away ignore ignore uh, sort of annoyed that person that can be really tough so i've just shared the link in the stream there basically this is actually a bit of hung lee content would you believe hung lee content goes into brain food that never happens um uh, but it was um, credit first to Rob McCargow. He's the guy that taught, taught me how to do this, but I, there was nothing online. Or I couldn't find anything online on the how to. So I just did a quick screenshot thing, uh, put a Twitter thread together, follow that thread. And you can basically add a recording of your name or indeed anything else for 30 seconds against your name. Um, a lot of marketing opportunities there, by the way, um, that, uh, uh, and then people can see and click on that sound sort of speaker icon. Uh, when they hover over your LinkedIn profile and then get to hear you say uh, your own name. So hopefully that's going to help. Anyway, useful tool. Might talk about that with Andy actually when we get him on. But um, okay, one more thing, uh, Adam. Uh, okay, one more thing. There's quite a few. Uh, so okay, um, I, I, I'll do. We'll do one more, right? And then can I ask you a quick question as well? Of so, course. Um, yeah, Google removing personal uh, characteristics for job ad targeting. Yes. Uh, probably long overdue, I would think. Um, so you used to be much, much more hyper personalized about who you got your advert to, um, and they've removed certain personal characteristics, and that makes it, uh, you know, it's not as good targeting necessarily for for recruitment marketers, but really good for again another diversity subject. I think I've got a big question mark against this because on the same sort of next to the um, uh, next to that post is also how do you do diversity sourcing? Um, and it, there's an incongruous kind of situation here where it's okay to target people if you're actively sourcing, it seems, you know, um, but it's not okay to do that if you're advertising against them. Um, and I'm thinking we we're in a bit of a moral mess here because what's the difference between me doing a Boolean search full of ladies' names, let's say, in order to get some female developers, let's say. I can do that. No one's going to question me on this. Everyone's going to say, go ahead, hon, that's brilliant. And yet I can't create an advert which would say, which would not even say, it would simply target uh, female names. I can't do that on Google or Facebook anymore. So I think we're heading towards a really weird place where one format is okay, the other isn't, but we're actually trying to do the same thing. It's a question mark. Bit of a difference, I think, between giving you the tools and actually enabling the or or providing the channel. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it enough, but it's because it's a good point you're making here, but I think there is a slight difference between um, between actually actually targeting adverts at individuals versus giving them a giving the ability to go and find because the thing is if they're giving people the ability to go and find individuals uh, people could be using that for good as well as for not so good this is exactly what I'm saying a lot of diversity sources and so forth will have to actively target in fact we're recommended to do that um, you know if you are looking to get more uh, purple people we talked about Jim Stry last week purple people into your business you can't just go and advertise you've got to literally look for them uh, and to do that you'll have to put in these terms which in an advert which should be discriminatory so yeah. we've got we've got this weird sort of the value system isn't aligned it's definitely not not coherent um and i'd be interested to know where we end up going with this and like you say i think the the, the meaning on this i think is is is, is uh, the sentiment is always positive for facebook and google to try and uh, stop if you like, uh, using personal data for targeted advertising. But you can imagine a lot of companies that are interested in DNI, DNI actually using that in order to get more diverse. And now they've lost the tool to do that. So, you know, it, it may not actually deliver the outcome um, that uh, that is part of the intent of, of, of this, uh, this, this initiative. Anyway, 
Um, okay, one more. quick. Yeah, just just a question. So oh. I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, every week, of course, I log on to the Hall of Fame um, to make sure that I haven't slipped down because I know you're always complaining about my lack of interaction. Um, and so uh, I, I really want to understand what is it that people can do to get ahead and come up that pyramid on the Hall of Fame? What is it that um, Kevin is doing to continue to remain number one? Yeah, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's a controversy, isn't it? Um, and by the way, folks, for people who don't know, Brain Food Hall of Fame is essentially uh, a kind of a mashed up system that I put out there. Initially, as a thank you for people who've been promoting the recruiting Brain Food newsletter, I just wanted to say thank you permanently. Say hey, put put a Hall of Fame up there. But then, obviously, COVID hit, and then I realised, you know what? I might repurpose this into something that would might help people get jobs. Uh, you know, if you are available, uh, there's a bandwidth slider when you log in. So you can say, hey, I've got 10 hours this week. I've got 40 hours this week. However much hours you've got, you can declare your availability and then you can connect with the people in the hall uh, that might also have opportunities or what have you. And a couple of people have actually got jobs through this. So I think uh, definitely worthwhile. Now there's a scoring system. How does the scoring system work? We'll publish that and we'll let you know. Uh, but essentially it is about, are you... Submitting content that gets featured in the newsletter. Um, are you uh, promoting the newsletter uh, sort of publicly? Um, are you uh, writing content or creating content that gets featured? Do you donate to the Brain Food Forest? Um, all that kind of stuff. So as we keep going, we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing all of this. Anyway, check out the Brain Food Hall of Fame, by the way. Subscribe or sign into it if you're interested um, in diversifying your income. Uh, if you're looking for work, I totally recommend you go ahead and sign up to that. Okay, let's get on with it. We're waiting for Andy Foote. Um, so let's bring Mr. Andy Foote on. By the way... Uh, Andy's on. been networking like crazy on the side. I've never seen anybody warming up the audience quite as much as he has. He, he's hustling, man. He's hustling. But I tell you, something special is, is happening here because Andy is not only going to join us for a chat, he's actually designed a custom presentation he's going to give to the audience. So you and me, Adam, have got an easy job. We're going to sit back and just watch this. Um, it's going to be fantastic. Andy Foote is one of the people who I think um, I'm always learning new things from Andy in terms of what is going on on LinkedIn. He's also managing a group on LinkedIn, which basically gives him all of the, the inside knowledge as to what's going on. So we, we're, all, we're all about to benefit from all of this. So let's welcome Andy on screen. Um, and hopefully the tech's going to work. Um, we can see where we go. There he is. Hello, hello. Andy, how are you doing? Good. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine, mate. Excellent. Good to see you, sir. And you, buddy. Um, love the way that you always big up me. Uh, like, no pressure whatsoever. Um, hey, listen. Um, geez. No, no, no. Your, some of your blogs are actually the, uh, the most well-read sort of articles ever on, on Brain Food. Um, like, there's a massive demand for people just getting quality how-to insights um, on how to get better at the big blue. You know, this is the platform that we all are on. Um, you can't avoid it if you're a recruiter. Um, uh, to, arguably, if you're no good at LinkedIn, it actually damages your rec recruitment capability. Um, if you're hiring for a recruiter, probably you should examine how fluent they are with LinkedIn um, because it is a, the dominant app that we're using. Even though everyone says don't use LinkedIn, use scraping, use other tools. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but it's still the thing you have to switch on after your inbox. So super important and great that you're here to share some knowledge uh, with this, uh, Andy. It's always a pleasure. Yes. My only my only regret is that I did not get the dress code memo. Uh, apparently, it's white shirt. Uh, you didn't fucking tell me that. Thanks very much. White shirt, um, gold chair, mate. I mean, you got to bling out as well, right? I mean, it's... and no question, no questions at all from Adam. I'm, I'm I don't want to hear from him whatsoever That's his it. questions are always always difficult and i was surprised you allowed him to take uh, talk about the pronunciation feature uh what else am i going to talk about now i mean thanks, <laughs> was, thanks just, very much i just want to say one thing um hung on on the white shirt thing hung hung definitely follows the barack obama uh steve jobs um sort of process of we're exactly the same thing every day so that you don't waste two seconds every morning actually working out what to wear and i think that's a productivity mind hack it's it a is a, 
It is a productivity mind hack, and it's also a case where essentially, I mean, I've learned accessorizing is a thing, uh, and I've also learned that I have no, I have no taste. Um, so when you have those two things together, it's like terrible. Uh, if I was fashionable, I would totally wear different things. I'm not fashionable, so I wear a white shirt. Boom. Did someone say taste? Did so taste? <laughs> Rita, Rita Sport. Well, it's obviously marketing. I mean, that's why, because once you eat it, you're sporty. You're not fat and lazy, and it's you know it's not bad for you. It's marketing, and it's uh, it's actually Galaxy is number one. All right, Rita Sport is number two. Just I'm not sure I accept just, that. I'm not sure yeah. I accept it. Um, all right, we're gonna have a vote on Rita Sport at the end of the day. Oh, by the way, folks, if anybody's got any questions for Andy, please do ask them in the Ask a Question section at the bottom of your screen on Crowdcast. If you're on LinkedIn or you're on Facebook or you're on uh, Periscope and you want to ask uh, Andy a question, ask it in comments anyway. I'm going to try and get to it. Um, we're going to try and monitor different channels this time. But if you're on Crowdcast, ask the question at the Ask a Question feature. Okay, Andy, we're going to go to you and you're going to share screen with us. Is that right? I am, but Adam was raising his hand and I don't want to ignore him. Oh, now he's frozen. I do want to ignore him. Let's just go to uh, uh, Europe. Uh, Andy, I'm going to focus the screen on you. All right, um, here we go. Um, so I am going to share my screen uh, presentation that I was working on up until 10 minutes ago, just uh, especially for you guys. Uh, you should be able to see it now. Um, share screen. Oh, we, we, let me just focus it on, on the presentation. I think I can do that. There we go. I think that's right. Can everyone see Andy's presentation, by the way? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, I think I can. I just want to make sure the crowd can as well, just to make sure. Just comment on the chat room, guys. Can you see Andy's uh, presentation okay? No one's answering. I think it's just a lag. I can see it. Uh, go ahead, Andy. I think we're ready to go. Yeah, I'm getting the yeses now. Great. Awesome. I uh, hope the font size is big enough. All right, so... I've um, called it the LinkedIn content challenge because I, I want to focus on uh, content uh, this morning um, and, you know, content journey, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so let me get stuck in. Um, first of all, post quality. Um, let me just share this with you. So I put this infographic together uh, a few weeks ago and shared it as a post. And what I was trying to demonstrate here was the, you know, the algorithm will uh, actually decide the quality of your content, of your posts, of your articles, um, and it'll decide it before anyone sees it. Now, that's mind-blowing. How does it decide? On what basis does it decide? You know, um, we don't really know uh, exactly how. We can take some guesses, and I'll, you know, I'll delve into that some more. But that's, uh, I think, yeah, that's, that's I think, going to surprise a lot of people. It's like, wait a second. The algorithm is going to judge the quality of my content before it reaches anyone at all. All right, so think about that. Um, and then, of course, LinkedIn is very mum about it. It's either low quality or good enough quality, I guess. They refer to low quality. Um, and then what happens if it is low quality? I'm going to say it's crap in my language. If it decides it's crap, then it shows it to no people. Um, or it might show it to some people just to confirm its crapness. Um, if it's not crap, if it's great, then it shows it definitely shows it to some people and uh, the people that it shows it to in that initial round of testing um if they engage by reacting or commenting or in fact even resharing then the algorithm is uh, kind of confirmed that yeah we were right and so we'll continue to do that round of testing so it keeps on doing the test keeps on doing the test and it tests and tests and tests until it peters out until it's had its life. Now, are there some posts that get an awful lot of engagement fast? Yes. Uh, do human editors come in at that stage? Uh, yes, they do. But if you think about it, the algorithm is the only way, um, apart from subscription, right? We can talk about that. But the algorithm is the only way to act as the hopper for all of the content that's produced daily uh, on the LinkedIn platform. So they need uh, they need a funnel to uh, figure out what to do with it, all of the content that we're producing. So 
that's uh, that's essentially what that um, what that infographic was getting to. Um, I want to I want to move on to something that I spotted. Um, I think it was I don't think one year is that was the uh, the time of this the, the screenshot. Uh, this was back in 2018. There was a presentation by Bonnie Barrelow, who's a data science manager. And the presentation was pretty good. But what was more interesting to me were some of the questions that she fielded uh, towards the end of her presentation. It's on YouTube. Uh, and I can I can send I can give you guys a link uh, later. Um, so one of the questions was, uh, how do you use the quality of the post to optimize the feed? And uh, her answer is, well, we don't have a lot of engagement data before a lot of people have seen a post. So in that sense, we don't have that objective measurement of how much people are going to like to see it, uh, to like it if we see it. But what we do have is all the attributes of the post. So this is, uh, this is all about the post quality. So they're looking at the member who posted, its content, its text, any photos that are on it, the relationship between the poster and the potential viewer. So all of those things are what we use to decide the expected quality of the post. And someone pointed out, um, a friend of mine pointed out in comments uh, to this, this post, she said, well, expected quality, surely she means expected popularity. And I think that's right, right? So it's the expected uh, popularity, I think, is more accurate of the post as a signal of whether it's good rather than its inherent attributes. So that I think uh, is, is very interesting that they're, they're making this decision um, before anyone sees it and they're trying to decide on the basis of their various data points of you know, what makes a, uh, a good, high, low quality uh, post. Andy, quick question. Um, yes. somebody's, asked, somebody's asked in the questions, is, is is the number of contacts or followers that a user has, uh, does that bear any influence on this whatsoever yeah. or not? Great. So that whoever asked that question is bang on because that's something I'm going to come to because that was actually one of the other questions that was asked from the audience uh, after, uh, after Bonnie's uh, presentation. So let me get to size of network uh, in, in a moment. But that's a great question, whoever asked it. Um, it was so, person, it was personal Meritan, which is not a real name, so that's why I didn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> okay, so um, so I I I, I zeroed in on um, whether or not historically you you were able to build up any momentum, right? Um, and I asked Bonnie this. I, I said, so really, you're only as good as your last post, then, is what you're saying. And she uh, she said that 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 wasn't quite right. Uh, I, I think that I am right on this. I think that the way that it's set up currently is it's always looking for fresh it the algorithm is always looking for fresh content. And guess what? If your last one or your last two uh, posts stank, then I think that's something that the algorithm uh, takes into account. So I, I think the more you know, the more uh, the more uh, let's say the more success you have on the batting rate. Uh, I think that factors in. I think you you do build up uh, uh, some steam. Um, all right, so, yeah, so Bonnie says, hi, Andy, just wanted to shed some light on this. When I said historically the model was focusing more on the past engagement of, of a post as a signal of whether it's good, I meant the past engagement on that particular post, um, all the engagement it's already gotten before a particular viewer sees it. So that's quite confusing, but she is measuring engagement and I guess the buildup of engagement. But she's not talking about your, you know, your batting record, your 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 history um, of all your prior posts. In other words, historically, the feed couldn't do a very good job of predicting the quality of a particular post until the post had already gotten some engagement. Now, the feed is better able to start predicting the quality. I think she means the algorithm is better able to predict the quality of a piece of the content as soon as it's posted before anyone ever sees it. And then it continue updates that prediction. So in other words, the testing that I was talking about. So, you know, my, that's my, uh, the next paragraph is my, is my comment in, in quotes, LinkedIn will rely less on prior engagement going forward. All the content you wrote before. Yeah. That's in the rear mirror. Uh, she says that's not accurate. On the contrary, if you regularly post thoughtful content that sparks interesting conversations, the feed will learn strong affinities between you and the people you talk to. Now, that, those are two separate things. I'm talking about is there some way of building up momentum? And she doesn't really address that. She's talking about affinities, and they're two very different things. All right, so I'm talking about can I become known as a great author 
is LinkedIn going to reward me? Is going to give me further reach because of that? And she hasn't answered that. She's talking about affinities, uh, and they're two separate things, and they're important. And I'll sh and I'll show you why uh, in a short while. So, yeah, the the question that was asked um, is 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 this basically the question from the audience? Not not you know, English was not uh, I think his first tongue. Uh, he says, is there any use of the percentage of people that are in your network compared to how many react to your content? So she says the feed has a sense of affinity between members. So if you and I are connected, but every time you see my post, you never respond to my post, the feed will learn not to bother showing you my post anymore because it's not going to work. So in that sense, if someone is connecting to a bunch of random people, Right, but never talking to them, it won't really get them anywhere because the feed will learn that these people are not actually interested in each other. And my 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 bit, bit at the bottom is conf confirmation that building a network on LinkedIn is all about connecting rather than collecting. If you have weak ties, your content will die on the vine. So I think that answers the question, right? I think we're all in um, aggressive network building mode, right? We. I think we will have a sense that having a larger network is going to be much more helpful to us, more beneficial to us than having, you know, uh, only people you know in real life. I think we're most of us are beyond that. So we're building, building, building in the hope that, well, maybe this benefits me in some way. But uh, I think it's clear from what Bonnie was saying, and I think we understand this, uh, people who regularly uh, post content, is that it's not about having thousands of people uh, either in your follower uh, uh, bin or your connection bin, right? That doesn't matter. What matters are your fans, and it matters. Uh, it's two way. So you, if you want to create more fandom, then you have to go out and you have to actually click on other people's content. You have to engage on it to strengthen those ties. If you want a particular person to become a fan, you must become a fan of theirs. If you want to carry on, you know, building your fan base out. Um, so that, that's, I think, an important distinction because you can have thousands of people in your network, but the reality is the vast majority of, of them are going to be lurkers, right? Uh, the vast majority are never going to stick their head above the parapet and they're never going to engage on your stuff. You're just collecting those folks. The fans, on the other hand, those are super important because within the first hour of, of, of posting something, if you only get uh, a handful of people who will respond either by reacting, by commenting, or by resharing, uh, then you're probably not going to get much reach. However, if within the first hour you get over 30 right uh, reactions and over 20 comments, you're off to the races. Uh, and I can talk more about that. Um, the other question that I thought was interesting after Bonnie's uh, presentation in 2018 uh, was the question of... Um, Bait posts. So she called it, she called them like baity. The question was, wonder if you've seen behavior changing perverseness. And she was talking about rats uh, in the actual presentation. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And how you specifically respond to these kinds of cases. So uh, she says, so certainly any system can be gamed. And I think we're just trying to do a good job of making sure that we're not relying too much on any one signal. So, for example, writing a very like baity post that's very easy to like might cause broad distribution, so we wouldn't want to, and she peters off, if all we optimize was for likes, for example, then like bait could take over the feed. But using a more diverse selection of signals helps make sure it's harder to gain. So they're obviously looking at all of the data points that they can get. And, um, you know, some of these data points will be negative. Some of them will be positive. So the obviously obvious positive ones are if someone follows you, if someone likes or reacts now, right, to your content, uh, comments, and the reshares. Now, I have no idea if there's any weight or, you know, how much weight there is to any of those things. Uh, but... To me, my sense, and I think a lot of people do this on a, for, on a regular basis, will, will definitely say comments. Comments has to be one of the most important uh, data points, right, in, in what the algorithm looks for. Uh, and I think it's not just um, the comments received. I think it's also the author's comments. I think it's your responsiveness. Uh, I think that's also uh, factored in when deciding, you know, reach. Um, resharing is, a, is an odd one. Uh, we can talk about that, but resharing, it seems like it would, it ought to have a lot of weight, uh, but it doesn't 
uh, it doesn't apparently have as much as you, you'd think if people are willing to take the time to actually reshare your content you'd think wow that's that's quite a strong signal and it doesn't seem to be treated as strong or given the you know the weight according to the algorithm in terms of you know historically what we've seen in terms of uh, stats so that's um, like base. He should use that example. And then the other thing I was going to say was, yeah, negative signals. So, for example, if someone is um, if someone is blocking you, or if they're muting your content, if they're deleting your content, right? Think of all of the actions that you can possibly take around content. Everything is taken into account. Um, and of course, it's always changing, right? So this was 2018. Uh, this presentation by Bonnie. The most recent thing uh, was dwell time. So I'll talk about that. So dwell time, in essence, is uh, trying to build a better mousetrap because um, what I think what LinkedIn have realized is they need, they absolutely need to get the home feed sorted. Uh, by sorted, I mean it's essential for them to make that a place that people will actually check. Uh, they need people there. Why? Well, because it's, it's, it's all about the money. Follow the money. They put sponsored content there. All right. So apart from needing uh, members to be tuning in and to be constantly on the platform, constantly producing free content for them, they need them to be checking their home feed or now, you know, as it's been renamed, their news feed. That's important. Words matter, not your home, but your news feed. They need it to feel newsy to you, something that you need to check on a regular you know, uh, basis. So they need it to work. And what's happened, or I think what's happened, my, my deduction is that it's too much. It's a big ask for users to actually train the home feed. I don't want to do it. I've got a ton of better things to do with my time. I'm sure you don't want to do it either. And it's just a chore, right? Who wants to go through all of the crap just to find the, the, the good stuff? Who wants to go through all of the noise just to find the signal? We don't do that. We don't want to do it. And so they came up with dwell time, which in essence is monitoring our behavior over the home feed. So what are we doing? What are we slowing down on? That's the first measurement. Oh, he slowed down. That's cool. Interesting. Uh, noted. Oh, he clicked. He clicked. Well, that's another part of uh, what we should be measuring, right? Um, after the click, how long did he spend on that particular piece of content? Oh, let's measure that. And when did he bounce? Let's measure that. And how often is he doing it? What kind of content is he doing it on? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So that's dwell time, and it's pretty clever, and I like it because anything that takes the work away from me to, you know, to surface to feed me more interesting stuff, uh, then I quite like that machine learning approach, and that's what that's what dwell time is. Uh, and I wrote a post about it here, and I just basically summarized uh, what I wrote there. All right, the rebranding of the home feed to the news feed. Uh, and LinkedIn data scientists needing a better bounce, uh, mouse trap uh, because dwell time is always measurable. Real valued measure of engagement can be more reliable indicator of engagement and no shortage of signals. No shit, right? Lots of signals there. All right. So uh, any questions about that or we can do Q&A at the end. Uh, happy to do either. Any Let's keep like going. Let's keep going. Okay. Any questions anybody has, please put them in ask a question section. I just want to emphasize that reason is because we can then collect them together and then answer them in order. And once we answer them order, what I'm actually trying to do is also clip them so that we'll have things that we can send. Basically, here's a question. Andy answered it. Boom. You've got 10 second video on that. So ask questions where we need to be. Um, go ahead, uh, Andy. Yeah. So the next thing I wanted to do a bit of a, a pivot to polls and you 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 you'll see why i think i like polls because it's a it was a brand new feature and i had to get early access to it so of course i jumped straight in and i started producing all of these polls and i was looking for all right what gets engagement but i was also looking to understand how my network my immediate network and their immediate network um how they think and because that's that's the reach right it's still it's still um governed by the algorithm so you it's treated exactly like a post but interestingly polls you never get any stats which is really really weird right linkedin made that decision not to give the author the poll author any stats other than just the the poll stats you know um who voted and how 
uh, and that's you know that's that's about it. And then they'll give you a timestamp. So, turning to polls, I'm using polls certainly for gathering intel, trying to understand my audience better, my tribe better, um, and I'm I'm trying to be as creative as possible. And I'm poking and trying to understand, you know, what's going on with content too. Uh, and I'm also looking for engagement. They're definitely an engagement tool as well. And I'll, I'll show you how. But so an obvious one for me would be, do you know how the LinkedIn algo works? And, you know, this is exactly what I expected, right? The vast majority of the people in my uh, immediate network and theirs. Uh, no, not, not really. Now, you know, let's leave sample size out of it because I don't think, uh, I don't think any poll uh, on LinkedIn are going to be terribly scientific or, you know, statistically accurate. Um, so, and I think, you know, I'm not a statistician, but most people, uh, I think people who are will tell you why and that you really need uh I think you need two things. You need to have a, a, a decent, and we could talk about you know what a decent sample size is, but you also need to have uh, a properly constructed uh, uh, poll, you know, to get um, the best in terms of accuracy. So yeah, how does the algo work? Well, people don't really know, uh, which is good for me, obviously, because I can try and tell them, and uh, they can decide. Well, yeah, that makes sense, and you know, if Andy's Andy's observed this, I've also observed observe this so that seems to that seems to, to be true um and of course it's it's changing all the time so uh the other uh big question about the algorithm and the content journey uh or the content challenge is does adding a url in your post body harm reach and there's still you know a, a lot of finger in the air stuff with the, the url uh recently you know this was this was too much this was some time ago um that i did this poll but recently a lot of the people who are studying this observing uh content movement throughout linkedin uh, they're saying actually i'm finding that adding a url in the post body actually does not harm reach and i'm hearing that from a lot of people uh, and i think that's that's true i think that's what i'm seeing too so we may we may not have to do the the gymnastics of putting a url in the first comment um, and then going back and editing it in uh, which was you know the common method to try and uh, psych the algorithm so uh, test that for yourself, but you can see from that poll uh, some months ago that uh, a lot of people really didn't know whether it did or, or did not, and you know only 69 votes. Um, and here's what I'm asking about the quality part of it, right? The algo test content for quality should users be told what this means? Uh, clearly, you know a lot of people uh, would say yes to that, right? Um, I'm not, why would you say no? Uh, LinkedIn actually had a was hashtag, it, was it LinkedIn right? people Yes, yes, go ahead. No. Was it go LinkedIn ahead. people who said no? <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm, guessing, I'm, I'm guessing yes. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm guessing yes. So hashtags, I wanted to ask about, that's the other thing that people uh, talk about a lot is, so how important are hashtags in relation to content are, are on LinkedIn? And from this, right, it's a badly constructed poll, right? I should have just gone for very uh, important or not important. Uh, IDK, you know, that, that doesn't really tell you anything, does it? But however, um, you know, the, the, the deal with hashtags is that last year, Pete Davies, uh, who re incidentally recently left LinkedIn, he was a, a LinkedIn spokesperson responsible for product development uh, and a few other things. He's recently left, and I'm, I'm trying to get him on my podcast. He says, I can't, I can't talk about LinkedIn. But last year, he kind of became famous because he was the person that said, look, it's three. It's a maximum of three hashtags. And it's so unusual for LinkedIn to be so prescriptive when it comes to content and the algorithm. And so I took that as gospel and I, I, I keep telling people it's three, all right? It's three, no more than three. And then, you know, I've shared this before, but there's some other testers out there who found that if they analyze the URL of a post, they would see, sometimes they would see the first three hashtags in the actual URL, all right? So that's another I think clue that that you know there's there's something to that. However, you know when all when all is said and done, you have something as recently as this from Jia Ding, who's the director right of data science at LinkedIn. Look how many hashtags she's using. She's using six. So WTF, right? <laughs> it's like, all right. Well, Pete's told us this last year, and now Jia, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, right? Uh, six. All right, so uh, 
it's confusing. It's confusing as heck. Um, so, yeah, I just throw that bomb out there. Uh, and then, you know, using polls and, and understanding polls better. Um, like I said, for engagement purposes, I love using polls. This one was uh, was one of my best in terms of, you know, how many votes I got, right? Uh, almost 2,300. Awesome. But I'm not really that bothered about the votes. What I'm more interested in are the comments. 538 comments. Now, I don't have any views on this. Like I said, you don't get stats with polls for some weird reason. Uh, and this is, this is, I think, it's close to the perfect poll because what I'm doing here is I'm asking about something that everyone does. All right. So this is going to be universally of interest. Uh, everyone has a sign off. Everyone does it differently. And that's why I started the poll because I keep messing around with my sign off. I can't decide what to end with. Right. And I probably overanalyze and, and overthink it. And I keep switching. Well, some of the interesting comments that came out were that, you know, the, the U.S., uh, anyone in the U.S. forces will sign respectively, uh, respectfully. So that's kind of code. Even when they leave the service, it's like a code. It's a shout out. Hey. I served. And that's, you know, one of the takeaways that you get from all of the, the juicy comments. And of course, if you were thinking about repurposing content, then polls are perfect for this because this you can spin out to articles, posts, uh, whatever. Uh, so I love that poll. I wanted to share that with you in terms of, you know, getting engagement, thinking creatively about what you can do on LinkedIn. And then the other thing I wanted to end on was, you know, comments uh, in and of them, in and of themselves, are very important because what you're doing is you're elevating your brand, you're uh, engaging with both fans and new potential fans. And if you nail the comment, if you add value right in the shortest possible space, if you're brief with your words, uh, but they're you know they hit the target as far as the audience is concerned, then they really it really pays off. So Charlie Wyman. Uh, had this poll and she said based on your own experience so far what do you think is linkedin's biggest strength when it comes to business development um i think there's some more to that and then her four were lead generation follow-up collab uh direct sales prospecting now i don't know if she did this intentionally but uh, people will have other reasons for using uh linkedin or, or see other benefits right so i chose number five and my number five vote was showing off. I think the LinkedIn platform is unmatched when it comes to raising your profile. Everyone here has an equal opportunity of being a standout when it comes to knowledge sharing. Not only does LinkedIn make it incredibly easy, they also give an expanding menu of ways to share know-how. Posts, articles, LinkedIn Live, native video polls, stories, featured section, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and you know, I said, basically, it's the best way to sell yourself. Um, if you're selling, you know, what you know and what you do, LinkedIn provides the highest RO. So I get, I get 72 likes on that. Uh, and I'm getting some discussion around that too. So, you know, this, this, I think nailing the comment is important. It helps if you're adding value, the 72 likes, you know, that's from a combo of my fans and from people who say, Oh, who's this Andy foot fella? Um, and then, you know, they might jump on, onto my, uh, my, my profile, uh, and check me out and potentially become a, a client. Right. The other one that I want to share is from uh, Arena. Um, why do people share how to uh, make a post go viral? If you want a post to go viral, you need to know what triggers sharing, uh, et cetera. And I took a different tech. All right. What I did was I said, look, I'm not interested in viral posts. I'm interested in viral engagement. If you write or create something that busy people take their precious time to engage on and have conversations with others in comments about, you've achieved something fairly rare and special on this essential and wonderful platform. And I got 80 likes and 50, 50 replies. So I am trying to win the comments, right? That's what I'm trying to do because then I'm at the top, right, uh, of the, the comment stream. And so yeah, everyone has that opportunity. Uh, so that's the presentation. Uh, I've covered, you know, a couple of different areas and happy to answer any questions. That was amazing, Andy. Thank you very much, man. Um, can you can stop sharing screen by the way, Andy? Um, so go ahead and do that. Wow, I learned a, f a huge amount straight away. Uh, last point. I just, by the way, we'll get to the questions in a bit. So if you have any questions, having seen that, please ask a question at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, just ask them in the comments. Oh, I'm going to get to them. I am monitoring on my mobile phone, so we're going to get there as well. Um, but the biggest takeaway for me, Andy, on this. 
uh, was number one, you got to engage people. Otherwise, they'll end up drifting away on the affinity thing that they have. Yeah. Whereas yeah, Hung Hungry is actually very bad at engaging people because uh, I, I, I literally don't go to other people's posts. So I'm one of these probably people that LinkedIn don't like because I post my stuff and I hope people comment on my stuff and then that's great. But I don't comment on other people's stuff. LinkedIn, I believe, has penalized me for this. Um, I think my account has definitely been uh, in, in, in tech, we'd call it tarpeded. Um, so in other words, it's just slower to do everything. Right now, for instance, LinkedIn Live used to guarantee four or 5,000 views guaranteed, no problem given the, the reach I had, whatever. We'd be lucky to reach a tenth of that right now. Um, yeah. And I think that's because I'm tarpeted. I think the my LinkedIn profile, because of my failure to continue to engage with my connections and people and try to engage with me, that has resulted in my profile kind of in between being banned and sandboxed, it's top it. It just slowed down. So I'm going to start talking to people on LinkedIn. Uh, so that's what I've learned. Um, how about you, Adam? What, what's the one thing you learned from, from that share before we go into the questions? Uh, well, I mean, I, I learned an awful lot and um, I've written down a whole load of notes and I'm going to be copying that. But I do have a question, um, Andy, which is, I don't think you touched on video unless I was answering something some of these questions or something at the time um what about video is that something that uh we should be doing or should not be doing and if so should we be yeah. linking to youtube or should we be doing it on the app on your phone or what yeah so i i personally i i stay away from answering any questions about video because i don't i don't have enough of um like history a track record of understanding exactly what's happening but um it was a, a very interesting study by um, a Dutch uh, LinkedIn trainer called Richard van der Blom last year, where he basically he um, he tasked his local university marketing department to analyze 3,000 uh, posts, LinkedIn posts, and uh, basically they, they came back with all of this uh, juicy data. And one of the takeaways regarding LinkedIn video at that time, so last summer, was that the, 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 the gloss seems to be coming off the shine seems to be coming off linkedin video uh and they could they could show that in terms of you know the the content that he gave them to analyze that people just seem to be going uh you know from this interest level to this interest level so it was definitely you know it was reducing back then i personally think the problem with linkedin video is that people don't know what they're going to get until they actually click and start watching and they they need to be able to be in a position to give that time commitment um, and you don't have that friction with, uh, let's say, a text post because you can quickly scan it, and it's you know it's much shorter in terms of attention span. So that's the first problem. I think the second problem is, you know, we're not professional. We ain't professional broadcasters, and I think people are still looking for that. Sure, we can talk about authenticity, but I think they do want it to be professional. They don't want to be distracted, and they want the nuggets. They want the value straight away. So if you're airy fairy and you you believe, you know, oh, okay, I want to, you know, have this little chat before I get into and get stuck in. No, no, that's not true. And also, I've yet to see something which is on video which couldn't have done equally well via text, right? So what is the reason? Why are you why are you doing this on video? If it would work on text and i still don't see that so there those are the main three factors there are some people who are doing linkedin live incredibly well i want i'd give a shout out to share jones uh and of course the reason she's doing it incredibly well is no accident she has 20 years of broadcasting experience that's why she's so effing good at it and these people who think they can just do it uh overnight and get better at it why are we going to tune in to watch while you get better at it Right. So it's it's similar with my infographic. Right. You can you can do crap content or you can do great content. That's your choice. But don't waste our time with the crap. Uh, we need to see the great. And it's very competitive out there. Uh, and you know, as 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 to Hung's question about, you know, being sandboxed um, in some of this may be related to dwell time. Right. So if you're not producing content, which which basically helps dwell time, so helps your dwell time then you may be penalized in terms of reach. I've been doing dwell time unconsciously or subconsciously. Not un I'd have to be asleep. I'd have to be dead. Subconsciously, right, by using the sub, the, sub the post plus the document. That's my favorite form of, of content delivery. And what that does is um, I basically call it uh, uh, 
it's a an article wrapped up in a post right so the post plus the document means that you can have many pages on that document but while you have the, the people there and they're flipping through you know one page after another if that's 17 long 17 document pages long i'm getting maximum dwell time right so you know that 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 would be go ahead now on i'm gonna like send a message on a document with like massive font you know like a letter per page uh so yeah. you, you stay on listen everybody who's on linkedin now dwell time give me more dwell time folks stay on the page give me some interaction i'm on the mobile phone here i'm going to talk to you believe you believe it or not i'm was, actually going to talk to you on a, was a good, yeah there was a there was a um, there was a good post there was a good post i think yesterday where um a a, a, a an author had just put a text plus a graphic but the graphic was a where's waldo type so there were a ton of you know people i mean there were hundreds of cartoon people on this one page and he was basically saying okay where's Wal where's waldo but he called him bruno uh and so that was his attempt to try and test dwell time and of course he got massive uh reach massive yeah. in comparison to what he was normally getting so it seemed to test the thesis right i'm gonna do new stuff this weekend adam you're gonna say something yeah and i've got i've still got a couple of questions for andy if i can but it's well, up to you, you want to? all right so um uh, what about sharing posts so somebody's shared a post somebody's somebody's posted something and you want to share it every time i click share i get like 25 views so that doesn't seem to work any yeah thoughts yeah yeah so i think that's i think that's still that's still the case adam um i think you know the best you can do with a reshare um is to give it give it legs so give it as much of an intro from you as possible um Richard van der Blom actually says, well, create your own post using that content would even better. So it becomes your post rather than a reshare, right? But the, the, the midway house would be actual to, would be actually to, to preface it and to introduce it properly. So do that rather than just resharing it with like minimal one sentence because you're not trying and your audience will see that you're not trying. But I think of reshares as a redheaded stepchild in terms of the content challenge. Uh, the, re the, the, reason, the reason why is that, well, you know, I'm resharing something from Adam Gordon uh, Adam Gordon doesn't know, uh, it doesn't know, <laughs> I was going to say, my audience doesn't know Adam from Adam, right? Uh, because they're used to seeing my stuff. Who's this Adam Gordon guy? Why is that of interest to me? So that might be a challenge. That might be one of the challenges. Um, but you'd think, yes, it's counterproductive, it's counterintuitive, because if someone's going to do that, it's massive effort, right, to reshare. It takes time. It takes longer than, could take longer than a comment. Um, so, and yet it's not rewarded. It's not, it's not somehow you know it's, it's not recognized by the linkedin algorithm as a good right a linkedin good uh so one more question a, a question for you yeah a question for you hung actually how do you feel about getting tagged in posts um it, i've already ranted about that um I'm, I'm happy to be tagged if people want my help or you know the, the, it's like hey hung check it out i'm fine if i'm in a list of 25 people um because they want me to just amplify something then yeah that's super annoying i mean linkedin knows that's annoying that's why they actually had the remove mention feature built in so that you can go in there and just remove the mention which i'm afraid i automatically do because some people end up sort of responding to this and all you get is just noise into your feed uh which really just interrupts your your experience you don't want that so I think basically it's a form of spamming. I wouldn't do it. I mean, it has to be personal. Like anything, the difference between spam and non-spam is, is it genuinely personal? Um, and when you are part of a mass tagging wall, it's like, I get it. You want me to help you. Um, but no, it's like, I can't. I'm not going to do it. Um, anyway, right. We're going to hit these questions. Guru. We're a bit out of time. And there's eight questions. And I've asked people to ask them here. Um, so we have to go through them. Andy, quick fire. Um, this from ah, Tony Pitchard, my old, my old mate, Tony Pitchard. I've known him since I was five years old. Uh, Tony, hope you're well, mate. Um, right. Will quality filters on LinkedIn gradually destroy the attempts by some users to turn it into Facebook? I don't even know what quality filters are, um, but what's your, what's your view on that um, question, Andy? 
Yeah, I think uh, I think Facebook content is here, and I think it's essentially representative of how people want to use the LinkedIn platform. And it's all about creativity at the, at the end of the day. If you can create something that is valuable, interesting, educational, and it's it's done in a uh, Facebooky way, uh, whatever that is, then all power to you. Uh, but quality, you know, one man's meat is another man's poison. It's all it's all about how you view it. And there's such diversity on the platform now, which is a it, it's a great thing. Thank you. Yeah, perfect answer. And I totally agree. Um, let's forget the LinkedIn police. It's like it's there to use. The users yeah. will determine if you don't like it, you can ignore it or you report yeah. it or whatever. Yeah. Um, OK, um, can Andy send out his presentation? No, Meg, he can't. Um, is it seems Friday is the worst. Oh, here we go. Amy has said um, it seems that Friday is the worst day to post and get engagement. Is that your experience or something that can be known as a fact? So we're talking about the timing yeah. of your posts. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what my experience is. What matters is Meg's experience. If she thinks that's the case, then good. That's what she's observed and that's what she's experimented with. And, and that's that's fine. So timing, timing of, of posts, when to do it, that's something that you pick up after doing after a long, long while. And it's your own exploration and your discovery. Mine happens to be, you know, Monday mornings for my blog is Wednesday lunchtime. I know that for a fact because I've got the stats, but everyone is different depending on where they are and how they do it. Yeah, and also different, I guess, through your natural reach as well, right? I mean, basically, it's about your audience being awake or interested at that time. And because we've all yeah. got different audiences, it will, exactly. so it's not an objective answer is your answer. Brilliant. Okay, I'm going to rattle through these. Um, we've answered the hashtag question, Varun. Um, okay, we're at Trisha here. Um, how does this affect the job seeker? and where they land in the results of a recruiter's search. So does actually a job seeker's LinkedIn activity, does that influence their page ranking in, if the, in terms of them being searched as a candidate? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I would, you know, I don't know enough about this to answer either way, but I would say forget about, you know, search rank i would just say if you're going to do it then look at everyone else who's putting content out there um figure out how they're doing it look at the engagement that levels they're doing they're, they're getting see how it replicate how you can replicate so reverse engineer for you and do it anyway regardless of search and ranking because that makes you a better candidate because you know if you know the barrier is low and not a, you know a few, very few people are doing it in your space and you do it exceptionally well that's something else that they'll you know they'll think oh well, Susie's doing the LinkedIn content game very well. I think we'll have a chat. You know what? I just want to underline that. Um, Trisha, I'm not sure if you're a job seeker or not, or whether you're asking on behalf, uh, behalf of a friend, but I ha absolutely agree that if you are prominent on LinkedIn as, as, as a job seeker, that's just got to be a good thing. It doesn't, you don't have to appear on a search. Um, you're appearing in the newsfeed. It's better than appearing on a search. Um, so it makes sense, I think, for anybody who is currently interested in traffic or eyeballs, just to be on there and be interested in producing and, and contributing to the uh, to the conversation. Okay, rattling through. Adam, hope you don't mind me just piling through these. Um, we've got one from Matthias Simu. He said, any advice on posting PDF? Uh, I see some get better traction. Does that apply to your uh, dwell time thing or, or not? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Matthias, that's what I was talking about when I went uh, when I talked about my article in a in a post wrapper. That's what exactly what I do. So I do the post and then I attach a PDF. And then you know I think one of my my longest has been seventeen uh, pages or so. So do that. It's obviously a dwell time uh, gem. Cool. I'm going to do that, Adam. I don't know about you, but that's totally something I'm going to experiment yep. with next 100%. week. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We've got, um, okay. This is David Barlow from LinkedIn. So thank you, Joe. You're always a legend. Um, right. David's asking uh, this on LinkedIn, actually, how, how to best slow down people when you see their posts, how do you get them to dwell? We've talked about the PDF. Is there another way to get them to slow down? Um, I would be less interested in, about getting them to slow down. I mean, I would be more interested in getting them to click. So it's the first line that I'd be more focused on and then just delivering the goods. So make it baity. So if that mm -hmm. first line is um, is really, really good and then, you know, there's no filling in the sandwich, right? The the, the filling is, 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 is bare. Uh, you've got to deliver the goods after the first line. So as long as you're delivering the goods, 
then the dwell time should come naturally. And that's why I like the polls as well, because if you have that other as a third or a fourth option, then you're going to get maximum dwell time because everyone has a opinion. Yeah, amazing. Okay, quick one before we go to the last question. Um, who's the best first line writer on LinkedIn that you know, Adam Gordon? Uh, Andy Foot. Andy Foot. Andy Foot. Who's the best first line writer on LinkedIn? No. Uh, so, yeah, who's the best? So there, there's a ton of people who uh, write great content. And I'm fortunate to be connected with um, a lot of them. And, and I also interview them on my podcast, Footnotes. So, yeah, there, there is. I'm not going to mention one. You know, there's um, what? Who's the guy? Uh, Morgan Freeman, right? Was asked um, some time ago. So, who, who are the people that you loved working with? And Morgan said, "Yeah, I'm not going to do that because he knew." He knew, right, that if he mentioned uh, two or three, then what about the other five, right, that he forgot to mention? He comes yeah. off looking, you know, clumsy, and it's just a no-no. So that's what you do. You take the Morgan Freeman approach. You never, ever. That's why I don't like those shout-outs, right, where they – the Friday shout-outs, because you're always going to miss someone, and they're going to feel uh, aggrieved and, and, and hurt. Just don't do it. You know what? I did once write a post like that. I, it was like, oh, here are 40 people I've learned something from this year. And, and the, the first line I wrote was, look, it's impossible to write this po this kind of yeah. post without upsetting someone. <laughs> so please don't exactly. be upset. It's just yeah. came. But I am going to actually contravene Morgan Freeman. I want to say the best first line writer that I know um, on LinkedIn, Mitch Sullivan. Um, I oh, think Mitch he, is very good. He writes brilliant First line yeah. gets me every time. I want to, I want more. I, I check it out. Yeah. And he kind of delivers as well on it. So he's a brilliant LinkedIn yeah. writer. Go and follow Mitch Sullivan on this. Okay, yeah. final question. This is from uh, Sharam. Uh, thoughts. Uh, Sharam's asking, thoughts on emojis in posts? Good, bad, ugly? Uh, do emojis help or not? So I, I personally, yeah, as a writer, I just I, I just like the text. All right? I don't like any um, any embellishing. Uh, or anything that's trying to be an attention grabber just for the sake of being an attention grabber. I just want, I'm a purist. I want the text. If the text is strong enough, then that, you know, that will get the audience. Um, I, I don't like the bit emojis. I don't like when people will put in GIFs or anything that takes up a heck of a lot of space in comments. I freaking hate that because it's, it's annoying and it's, it's, you know, it's like, I want comments. Why am I seeing this 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 image, this cartoon image? So, yeah, I'm, I'm a pure. As I say, that's what? personal opinion, though, Andy. I I know somebody who's absolute who said to me about four years ago they were absolutely adamant that within twenty years we're going to be writing. We're just going to be writing to each other in emojis. It's going to be a return to hieroglyphics. Yeah, and we're getting there. Yeah. So as, as I said, as I said, it, yeah, it's subjective. I personally can't stand them. But my point about, you know, in the comments is that it takes up too much space. Right. It's kind of selfish that you're taking up like triple quarter, uh, quadruple amount of space just for your shagging uh, cartoon. I want to read the next comment. So that's that's the main point. But, yeah, it's, you know, personalization and, uh, you know, your personality. Sure. And I, you know, I sign off with a smiley. Right. I don't do the emoji. I do the, the text smiley. So. You know, one thing on this, guys, and, and just to Shram as well, one thing I've, I've tried to do, which I think works, I'm not sure, but I, I kind of use emoji numbers to do bullet lists. Uh, I think it just stands out a little bit better. I'm not sure it has any kind of algorithmic impact, but visually I think it's not trying to trick the user, but it gives people a bit of a look to say, oh, there's a numbered list here. Um, and everyone likes this. Anyway, listen, uh, we've done answering that question. I think we've answered them all. Um, Andy, we're bleeding into your rest of your day. So thank you so much um, for everything you've done. Can you quickly, before I let you go, pick out your podcast and stick it into the chat stream? Because I'd love for people to actually log into that. I assume you're going to be talking a lot on LinkedIn. Um, so presumably people who uh, are enjoying this post and want to learn more, they want to go on to footnote and, uh, and, and, and check that out. I'll obviously email everyone who has registered to this webinar, um, to the effect of, Hey, everyone follow Andy. Um, cause it is very important if you uh, care about this type of stuff, it is fascinating. Um, and it's a changing beast, isn't it, Andy? So every, I don't know, I don't know how often LinkedIn ship. But it's it's like every day they push something and things change. Yeah. So we've got to keep a, yeah. a constant monitoring of it. 
best practice yesterday might be the worst mistake today. Um, so, um, so yeah, we have to keep looking at it. Andy, at the start of the show, I did say to Adam, hey, it might be an idea for me to bring you back onto Brain Food, do a quarterly, let every three months we get you back to one of these. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Would you be up for it? Uh, I'm going to order my white shirt now. White shirt, that's it. Um, bling it out as well, man. Um, no. All right, listen, that's it, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, if you enjoyed the show, by the way, just say uh, vote on something. I think there's a way you can do it. No, there isn't. You can just comment. That's totally fine. We'll be back next week, by the way, to talk about how to ask a great interview question. Um, if you're a recruiter or a hiring manager and you're wondering why some people have really good in-depth get to know you, really kind of um, uh, deep connections with people. We're going to try and get to the bottom of what that is all about. No more tell me about yourself type of questions. Uh, it's going to be a fascinating one. Uh, Charlotte Mustertz, I've screwed her name up. I think she's watching this right now, Charlotte. I apologize. She's going to join us for that. It's going to be a fantastic show. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you again to our sponsors, Indoors. Check them out if you're hiring for tech talent. Thank you, Andy Foote. Uh, thank you, Adam Gordon. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, we will see you next week. Thanks, guys.